Hello, Motor Rider World fans, and welcome to Paddock Talk, talking Moto GP from Aragon on Saturday. And I must apologize for not putting up the Friday Paddock Talk. It's just been a hectic weekend, very busy weekend so far, and just literally got back to our kind of apartment. It's 11 o'clock at night on the Saturday. So, uh, yeah, been a busy, nice, busy weekend so far. Breaking news pretty much from Thursday and Friday, uh, Augusta Fernandez has signed as the second uh, rider in the Gas Gas, the new Gas Gas Tech 3 branded team alongside Paul Espargaro. Um, it's, it's pretty much a move that wasn't wanted by Augusta Fernandez. He kind of came out or he has voiced his concerns about certainly a one year deal in MotoGP, which just seems to be. Uh, a deathbed as opposed to anything else getting a one-year contract for MotoGP if you look at the likes of Remy Gardner um, Darren Binder certainly uh, a one-year deal in MotoGP doesn't mean that much these days and um, Augusto Fernandez has been handed this dreaded one-year contract by KTM in this new Gas Gas Tech 3 team so uh, you know we have to wait and see how that all plans out I think Augusto is a great talent he's challenging for the Moto2 title with Ayagura going head-to-head -head there but certainly another case of a Ralph Fernandez situation where he said he didn't want to go up to MotoGP just yet and KTM kind of, you know, forced his contractual liability and said, you've got to do what we say. We are sending you up to the MotoGP paddock to go alongside Paul Spagro in this Gas Gas Tech 3 team. Ayagura, he was supposed to be the second rider in the LCR team taking Nakagami's place. Nakagami has re-signed for another year because... Ayagura, again, voiced his concerns, doesn't want to go up to MotoGP just yet, but it seems Honda have kind of listened to his request and kept him in the Moto2 season for another year, regardless whether he wins the title this year or not, he will be um, staying in Moto2. So Augusto Fernandez is the only rookie coming up into the MotoGP Championship for 2023. So if he doesn't win the rookie's title, uh, there's a serious problem there. But um, other big news, of course, the return of Mark Marquez pretty much ahead of schedule. It was only, well, he wasn't supposed to make a return until the testing at the end of the year, but he came back for the Mazzano test, did some good laps there, had a good feeling with the bike, and he's come back to a track that he absolutely loves. He's uh, done very well at in the past, uh, beloved Aragon in Spain. And so far on the Friday and the Saturday, it, there has been a difference in management with regards to Mark Marquez's laps, how many, you know, when he goes out, how he goes out, how much he pushes, how much he rests and all that. So the management side, management side seems to be there. The only problem that I still have with the Mark Marquez situation is, uh, and he proved it on Saturday, um, is he's got a crash in him. The Honda's got a crash in it. And how long are you going to get away with that? You can manage it as much as you like. A guy like Mark Marquez, whether he's coming back from injury and he's proven this, wants to go flat out no matter what he says about we need to build up into it we need to take our time he comes back he goes flat out and there's going to be crashes for Mark Marquez so how does he manage that with his injuries and that but so far it's been a decent return it certainly hasn't set the world on fire he had a good Friday up inside the top 10 Saturday's proved a little bit more of a battle um, but again the, the times the Ducati riders are just taking the times to another universe at the moment. But before the MotoGP boys even got out for the qualifying sessions, there was drama in the Moto3 qualifying. Um, don't know if you've seen it, but there was this incident in the pit lane with the Max Delgado Husqvarna racing team, where two of their team members uh, try to prevent uh, Adrian Fernandez from going out to follow their rider Sasaki. So you know there's a lot of tagging going on in Moto3. And it seems as if these two pit crew were instructed by someone because uh, headsets were being worn and they were given information by someone in the team to kind of stop Adrian Fernandez from getting out behind Augusto Fernandez. So stupid, the, probably the stupidest thing I've ever seen in the paddock. Um, how they thought they would get away with that, I don't know. Um, very unsportsmanlike and they have been sanctioned. So a 2,000 euro fine has been given to Max and his team for the ridiculous, ridiculous actions of those those two mechanics. Uh, but having said that, don't think they were the only ones in it. Of course, whoever was instructing them in the headsets to do it also um, should get penalised. But anyway, it's a 2,000 euro fine and those two um, technicians involved in the incident have been banned from two races, which is Phillip Island and Sepang. 
So, uh, yeah, that was before the MotoGP class even got out on track. When the MotoGP boys did go out on track in Q1, some big names in that Q1. If you look, Alicia Spargro, Zarco, Mark Marquez, Luca Marini, um, Alex Marquez, Paulo Spargro, they were all in that Q1. But it was Alicia Spargro and Johan Zarco who came out of that. Um, Luca Marini, just behind them, Mark Marquez will line up in 13th place on the grid. So it's going to be very interesting to see how he manages this race. It's going to be tough. It's all about tyre management. All the riders saying it's about tyre management. You can't go with a hard rear tyre because you'll just lose too much time at the beginning. Uh, got to go. You can't go with a soft tyre because it just won't last. You've got to go with a medium tyre. But it's all about tyre management and getting the tyre to last the entire race distance. So it's very much um, maintain, kind of conserve at the beginning and just try and make the tyre last. It's going to be very interesting race tactics. We know that the Ducati and certainly the Italian machines are very good at preserving their tyres. How are the rest? That kind of plays a little bit into Brad Binder's hand, but we'll talk about that just now. Maverick Vinales is another one that's had a, a very disappointing weekend so far. I, I had him tagged in certainly in top 10 in the overall results, but he really has battled on the second of the Aprilia's. He's down in 16th on the grid. Doesn't seem like anything special going to be coming from Maverick Vinales uh, this weekend after his great performances of late, certainly uh, getting his first podium for the Aprilia team that's really stood out and just can't see that coming now. Uh, Cal Crutchlow, the return of Cal Crutchlow in place of Dovi, who's of course, uh, as we all know, retired now. Cal Crutchlow's looked really good. He literally just came from a test at the Aragon circuit, so still fresh in his mind on the Yamaha, but he looks happy, looks nice and fresh, looks fast out on track. Just looks like a happy, bubbly character. Um, we know we all kind of thought he was going to come in miserable, having to, you know, do the last six rounds and be travelling to um, Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, Australia. But yeah, it's it's been great having Carl Crutchler back in the paddock um, alongside Darren Binder, and he's done a okay kind of job for now in nineteenth place, but kind of just been chipping away at it. Had a massive, massive crash. I think it was in FP three. Uh, down the back straight, 300 k's an hour, no brakes, had to jump off the bike. So a massive crash there. Um, luckily, rider is all okay. And great uh, scenes, if you haven't checked out on MotoGP.com, the video of his daughter waiting for him as he came in with Dad, P1, and Carl just giving his daughter a hug and taking him into the... I just love that kind of thing. That's what I love about Alicia Spargo, having the family there, and now with Carl Crutchlow and um, with his wife Lucy and baby girl there as well. Just love seeing that kind of thing. Darren Binder had a very tough day. Great improvements on Friday. Um, he was trying this new carbon fiber... Um, swing arm that he had tested in Mazzano that he really liked, gave him a little bit more stability, um, used it in FP2, made you know 1.2 second gain from FP1, brought it into Saturday, um, made some good gains again in FP3, but right at the end of FP3 had a crash while going on his final fast lap in the left-hander just coming out of the reverse corkscrew and unfortunately crashing out there. Um, the team then don't want to use that carbon um, swing arm again because in case it's been compromised from the crash so they used a, a different um, carbon subframe that Darren just couldn't get a good feeling with unfortunately crashed out again in FP4 when he was going to go for some fast laps and so that really did knock his confidence and it's such a pity because he was looking so happy so confident really enjoying the feel of the bike his times were improving by the lap he was really doing a great job but those two crashes certainly have set him back ever so slightly so um, for Sunday hasn't qualified well qualified last on the grid but we know Darren's uh, can pull out a result on Sunday get that good start um, and hopefully just pick his way through the field and to hopefully be challenging for some points. That'll, that'll be the ultimate goal, as always, there for Darren Binder. But keeping his head up, trying to get um, the two crashes out of his mind behind him and uh, use the positives from certainly a great FP2 session and an FP3 session before he went down. So luckily not injured, but uh, yeah, the team were working very hard and late to get uh, those motorcycles ready for him to go out and attack on Sunday. So fingers crossed that Darren Binder can do something special there. At the front end of the MotoGP, it was a very entertaining, very, very, very entertaining um, Q2 session there. It is Peko Banyaya that goes and smashes the uh, lap record once again there. Brilliant job by Peko. He just looked sensational. He looks so good on that Ducati. The Ducati strength certainly is, you know, before with Dovi it was under braking, but he had to square, 
couldn't carry corner speed and just punch that bike out. Peko has just got the complete package. He brakes late. The Ducati stops. It engine braking works so well. It controls the bike. It settles the bike. It, it gives Peko the feeling that he can just throw it in. In fact, all the Ducati riders, the biggest strength they have is hard under braking while the other bikes are, are loose. And you can see the engine braking not quite settling the bike and bringing it into the apex that Ducati just sits and it just cooperates and the riders can just put it wherever they want. And Peko just gets the best out of it. And a sensational lap there from Peko. It's going to be hard once again to beat Peko Banyaya at this Aragon track. He's piling the pressure on Fabio Quattararo, who finds himself um, kind of nowhere really in the fight. And we expected it on that Yamaha. He's done in sixth place, so another salvage job. But we saw with a couple of moments that Fabio Quattararo had. He's just riding on the absolute limit. And we always question, how long can he do this for? At what point will it break? And it's just starting to a couple of, not chinks in the armor. His biggest problem is he's got to try and fend off these Ducatis. It's Ducati 1, it's Ducati 2 with Jack Miller in second, it's Ducati 3 with Anaya Bastianini. Anaya Bastianini, top speed of 350 k's an hour. Fabio Quattararo, 341. So, I mean, that's 9 k's an hour down that back straight alone that Fabio Quattararo to somehow find. So, it's going to be a tough ask for Fabio Quattararo and all the meanwhile, Pico Bagna is just going on this roll. He's won 4 in a row, could it be 5? Don't see why not, to be honest. Jack Miller looks really good. He was running the soft, soft combination as only Jack can. Can he make that work in the race? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but he's certainly going to be up in the mix. We know that. Anaya Bastianini, I think it's going to be another Mizano repeat. Anaya Bastianini and Pekka Banya going head to head. Bastianini has looked phenomenal the whole, whole weekend. He's confident with the signing of his full Ducati contract for next year. And still in the mix with the championship. Cannot count him or Lacia Spagra out. And he's up there in third place. Going to be on that front row. Good start. And we know how good Anaya Bastianini is towards the end of the race. So I am putting my money on Anaya Bastianini to break the Pekka Banyaya run. Behind the Malaysia Spargo, brilliant stuff. Love him or hate him. Take your hat off to him. Uh, two big crashes. Wasn't looking like a good weekend at all for him. And he manages, manages to pull out a lap to put him fourth overall. After coming from Q1 into Q2, fourth overall in the grid. Brilliant performance there from... Um, uh, the Spaniard on the only Italian machine in the top five that is not a Ducati. So breaking up the Ducati charge there. Behind him, Johan Zarco, who also came from Q1. Brilliant qualifying them for, uh, for the Ducati rider. Then it's Quattararo. Bezzecchi, a brilliant qualifying because he was looking nowhere throughout the whole weekend. He's put himself there in seventh. Jorge Martin in eighth. A little bit disappointed. I thought he would be higher up there, but look out for him. We know that he's not uh, not afraid of getting those elbows out in the race. Alex Rins on the Suzuki there in ninth. Kind of forget about the Suzuki's Ron Mir pulling out, still recovering from that injury. Looks like he's going to miss the next couple of races. So it just really has been a disastrous year. Not only for Suzuki, but Jean Mir. It's just a fall from grace there from uh, the 2020 world champion. There's no doubt about that. Brad Binder in 10th. Now Brad was looking sensational. Got up to P2 at one stage in FP3. Got himself straight into Q2. Was looking and, and sounding like he, he really has got, he's found something uh, with the KTM and they they've you know brad was giving this kind of thing and he never gives that so i had a really good feeling with the ktm unfortunately a big crash in fp3 towards the end um, sounds like some ligament damage in his right ankle and a dead left leg that could halt him a bit he really did push as hard as he could got 10th in qualifying uh, ready to line up for tomorrow's uh, race so it's going to be a tough ask but look out for brad challenging in that top five Feels like he's got a top five in him. And a track like Aragon, where there are overtaking opportunities, a Brad Binder's going to shine. Miguel Oliveira, his teammate right behind him. And Takanakagami, the first of the Hondas in 12th place. So uh, recently re-signed with LCR, as we know, and up there in 12th place. So that is um, MotoGP from Friday and Saturday. I think it's going to be one hell of an entertaining race day. The weather, you know, certainly on Saturday, started off cold with a bit of a breeze, a very cold breeze that threw up... Uh, a couple of spanners in the works there, but it got really, really hot towards the end of the day. I think same kind of weather predictions for tomorrow. The riders do say, you know, that when the wind changes, it really does change how you've got to attack some corners and it throws curveballs in there. So a lot of things for these riders and teams to deal with. I think it's going to be an entertaining day in a very sunny Aragon racetrack. So I hope you sit back and enjoy it from wherever you're watching it. I will be trackside and then keep a lookout for Talking Motor G for Paddock Talk Sunday my Sunday review, and then Talking Motor GP Tuesday night, live on the Motor Rider World Facebook page, because I'm flying out Monday night back to the UK, and then Tuesday night, 
we will get into full detail of everything that's happened throughout the whole weekend at the Aragon MotoGP round.